All right, good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Tonight I'm streaming on YouTube and streaming on Facebook at the same time. <clears throat> Gonna go to a YouTube platform and then probably post it to Facebook uh, in the future, but right now I'm kind of doing a dueling banjo type of deal. So uh, for those of you who want to watch the PowerPoint broadcast, I recommend that you switch over to YouTube. Otherwise, I'll have the live going uh, where you can send me your comments, um, where the live is going through both platforms, but uh, I can easily see the Facebook live. So we're talking about lupus. Uh, interesting question. Uh, one of our staff members mentioned that she knew someone with lupus who thought that it was only a condition of the kidneys and not a condition affecting other parts of the body. And as it's termed systemic lupus erythematosus, basically lupus is a systemic condition. So lupus, the lupus process, affects many, many areas of your body. It can have widespread features. You know, no two lupus patients are going to be exactly the same. Um, there are different probabilities of developing different symptoms, but basically it can have manifestations from your skin to your heart, to your lungs, to your kidneys, to your brain, to your joints. All these different areas of the body can be significantly affected. Uh, these first few slides are from Kelly's textbook of rheumatology, kind of the gold standard in rheumatology, where for those of you on Facebook, I'll just kind of read a few of these for you and I'll say hi. I'll just pause and say hi to everyone who's joined us. Where lupus is most known for its malar rash. Now what does lupus mean? Lupus is Latin for wolf because when it was first described the skin lesions of lupus looked like bites from a wolf. So that's where it is coined from. But we can see the malar rash. Malar means a butterfly-like rash, typically over the cheeks. It can also involve the forehead. And it typically extends down closer to the jawline and the lips. There can also be something called a discoid rash. There's typical features of sun sensitivity. So lupus patients go out in the sun and they feel awful. Oral ulcers. Uh, that's a common feature of lupus. Arthritis. You can, may have joint swelling, tenderness, pleuritis or pericarditis. So pleurisy is a condition where lots of times you'll breathe and it'll be really painful or your doctor may be listening to your heart and he'll hear something like a rub relative to pericarditis. Kidney involvement, where protein starts to spill into the urine, seizures, psychosis, hemolytic anemia, low white blood cell count, low platelets low lymphocytes, positive labs for many of you have heard of the anti-nuclear antibody, the double-stranded anti-nuclear antibody, SM antibodies or Smith antibodies, cardiolipin antibodies. So I did a whole broadcast on mixed connective tissue disease and antiphospholipid syndrome. So a lot of lupus patients have antiphospholipid syndrome type antibodies. Uh, I can't remember the exact statistics, but I, if I remember right, I think it was around half of lupus patients are going to have signs of antiphospholipid syndrome. And so those are the characteristic features of it. But most rheumatologists will say it's typically a younger in age female presenting who may be losing their hair, alopecia. And it's not just like global loss of hair, either it's a chunk of hair or a complete loss of hair is most typical of alopecia. And they'll have joint pain, joint involvement, they may be fatigued, maybe they have some fevers. Um, and then they have these characteristic blood tests suggestive of lupus. And other factors to consider in the causation of lupus include genetics, UV light, Epstein-Barr virus, the infamous Epstein-Barr virus for all of you doing your celery juice smoothies in the morning, estrogen and prolactin, because basically there's a 9 to 1 female to male ratio, and even taking estrogen derivatives can be a factor for induction of lupus. Other medications, hydralazine, isoniazid, which is usually 
used to treat tuberculosis, methyl dopa, TNF alpha inhibitors, minocycline. Oh, I misspelled minocycline, sorry, penicillamine. So, a wide host of medications can cause what's called drug induced lupus, bacterial DNA, retroviruses, endotoxins. What are endotoxins? I think I misspelled that too, endotoxins, bacterial LPS. Endotoxins are lipopolysaccharides. So, I've been talking about the gut and diabetes. Lipopolysaccharides are pieces of gram negative bacteria that break off, go into the bloodstream. And when that happens, it induces inflammatory responses. So even here in this textbook, which is not the newest edition, they were recognizing bacterial lipopolysaccharides as an inducting factor for lupus, which really sets the groundwork for what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, okay, and we have some comments on mouth ulcers as well, and I'll, I'll try to circle back to that too. Okay, and then... One of the, the first bullet points in Kelly's textbook, they say systemic lupus erythematosus. Gosh, I, sh I should have uh, double-checked what I was writing here. I didn't capitalize erythematosus. Results from failure to regulate production of pathogenic autoantibodies, which appear years before the first clinical symptom of disease. So I'll say that over again. Basically, lupus results from failure to regulate production of pathogenic autoantibodies. What are autoantibodies? Those are immune cells that attack our own body. So lupus is a failure to regulate that production of autoantibodies. And those autoantibodies appear years before the first clinical symptom of disease. So I can't tell you how many times I've evaluated a 20 to 30 year old female with joint pain and fatigue and alopecia and they're showing signs of these antibodies maybe before they develop other severe symptoms like a malar rash or severe sun sensitivity and this raises the whole question of the overlap syndromes which includes undifferentiated connective tissue disease and mixed connective tissue disease and are these a spectrum that ultimately evolve into lupus topics for other videos but basically that's the overview. There are genetics that seem to be important which relate to the clearance of the immune complexes like HLA-DR2, HLA-DR3. Um, so all of that is important. Now, this is a great article. It's open access. So those of you who want to get it, it's from the Journal of Immunity, 2018. A hen in the wolf den. Kind of interesting they used wolf, but a hen in the wolf den, a pathobiont tail. And this is a really nice overview of the seminal article written by Manfredo Vieira in 2018. Dr. Vieira, or Vieira, I believe I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Vieira, did a, a study which I'm going to go into, which was published in the journal Science, I believe. Just so you know, in the world of scientific literature, the journal Science and the journal Nature are pretty much the top of the pyramid in terms of their importance. So when you see something published in those journals, it means, wow, this is some really solid science. This is uh, a seminal article. It's maybe going to change the way we look at things. And there's a lot of validation for all of the findings that they're findings and the theories that they're coming to. So basically, Dr. Vieira and his group found that this gut bacteria, Enterococcus gallinarum, was a trigger for inducing lupus in a type of lupus-prone mice. So they can basically induce genetics in mice and come up with a mouse model of a variety of diseases. So there's a mouse model for multiple sclerosis. There's a mouse model for rheumatoid arthritis, and there's a mouse model for lupus. And so they took these lupus-prone mice, and he basically found that Enterococcus gallinarum proliferation in the gut seemed to induce lupus. So that was pretty interesting. And if you want, you can pause your video, those of you watching on YouTube, and you can come back and look at this diagram. It's really a great diagram to understand what is happening. They even use the term leaky gut and how this Enterococcus gallinarum bacteria gets through the gut which is mainly skin, as I've been mentioning in other broadcasts, and then this bacteria, which can be innocuous, can also then induce disease. That's basically a pathobiont. A pathobiont sometimes is, you know, they're not a problem, and then at other times they can induce things like meningitis. So now the bacteria gets through to the liver, induces certain autoantibody responses, which we're very much seeing 
in SLE, also known as lupus. So basically, he treated these mice, these lupus mice, with antibiotics using vancomycin. And there are other nuances to the story, but we'll just say he gives these mice vancomycin. Vancomycin is a, now they try to use it kind of as a last line antibiotic, and it has particular effects on regulating gastrointestinal infections. And he noticed that basically when he gave the mice vancomycin, him and his group, their lifespan was extended and the antibodies lowered. So the beta-2 glycoprotein antibodies, other uh, endogenous retrovirus glycoprotein 70 antibodies, the antibodies went down when he gave them vancomycin, which is pointing to, is this lupus model a bacterial infection problem? And then they basically found this Enterococcus gallinarum bacteria in the liver, in the mesenteric veins, so basically the blood flow out of the liver, and then lymph nodes of the lupus mice. So basically they're seeing this Enterococcus gallinarum in the portal circulation, the liver, and the, meson and the lymph nodes of the GI area. So this is really, really important. Now, let me see. Okay, so then they also went on to say that da, 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 um, basically that's the same thing. So I'm not going to go into any more of that. And they compared this Enterococcus gallinarum to other uh, bacteria like Enterococcus fecalis and a Bacteroidetes uh, bacteria, and they weren't inducing the same types of problems. And he also showed that the Enterococcus gallinarum decreased expression of adhesion molecules, antimicrobial peptides, mucosal proteins of the ileum. So it's like this bacteria was then suppressing our immune system's ability to get rid of it. And he also, or him and his group also showed that, again, it was going into the organs, it was going into the liver, and it was inducing the production of something called interferon alpha, which is very much seen with lupus, and again, these other antibodies I mentioned. Now, I'm going to read a little bit here and hang with me. They showed, that's the mouse model. So then they start looking at humans, and they saw in humans that humans had basically the presence of serum proteins in their stool. So basically, bloodstream, we're seeing these proteins from the bloodstream in the stool in a way we shouldn't. Again, documentation, there's some sort of permeability issue in the gastrointestinal tract of lupus patients. And they also found Enterococcus gallinarum in liver biopsies of patients with lupus or autoimmune hepatitis, but not the livers of healthy transplant donors. So that's a huge find, because just because we see something in a mouse doesn't necessarily mean that it translates to a human. So now we're seeing basically the same thing, similar facets in human beings with lupus versus the mouse model of lupus. And then um, they found that co-culture, so now they put the Enterococcus gallinarum in human hepatocyte cultures and it induces the same uh, biochemical profile, the beta-2 glycoprotein antibodies, interferons, AHR activation, and basically found that patients with lupus and liver autoimmunity showed high titers of serum antibody directed against Enterococcus gallinarum. So they're seeing that the immune system of these people is fighting this bacteria. And they weren't seeing antibodies to other bacteria that I mentioned before, Bacteroides, Enterococcus fecalis. So they're saying that Enterococcus gallinarum is uniquely associated with lupus and liver autoimmunity in humans as well as mice. Big, 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 big finding. And that's why you saw it published in the journal Science in 2018. Because so many lupus patients are basically told, oh, we don't know why you have it. You have to go on basically immunosuppressive medications. If you know someone with lupus, you need to get them this information, in my opinion. Because so often they're on heavy-duty meds. They're just told, we don't really know why you have it. You're going to have to deal with it. And we're basically trying to monitor, you know, your organs, hopefully your organs don't fail, like your lungs or your kidneys particularly. And now with this information, we're seeing there's a clear gut connection to lupus. And this isn't just an esoteric concept. This has been validated to pretty much the highest scientific rigor. 
they also have shown that Enterococcus gallinarum is an unusual bacteria because it has a flagella or a flagellum. So flagellum is like a tail that propels it. Think of sperm. Sperm have basically like a flagellum, a flagella tail. Other types of uh, parasites have a flagellum to them. So this gallinarum has a basically has a tail that swim makes it swim like a tadpole, and they're thinking maybe that's why it is able to get through the intestinal epithelium and then into portal circulation and into the liver. And this is another interesting feature of this article from the Journal of Immunity. Leaky gut and nephritis in this lupus model are ameliorated by colonization with lactobacillus by increasing local IL-10 production and by skewing the balance of Treg and Th17 cells towards a Treg cell dominant phenotype and another SLE model, mouse model. So that's big. So basically now they're circling back to the mouse model and they're saying by giving these mice a probiotic, lactobacillus, which is the most common probiotic out there, or probiotic species, we'd say, lactobacillus, in essence, really helped their nephritis. What's one of the biggest concerns with lupus? It's nephritis, it's kidney damage. So helping kidney damage in mice through probiotic therapy. Again, now the next thing is to really start doing therapies on the human microbiome and human microbiome of patients with lupus. But big, big stuff. So circling back to those of you watching on YouTube, you can see how they demonstrate the healthy mouse as a diverse microbiota. The lupus prone mouse has a non-diverse microbiota, microbiome meaning your 37 trillion bacteria in your intestines and colon. That induces leaky gut. That allows this Enterococcus gallinorum to get into the portal circulation, which goes to the liver. And I think I may have misnumbered that earlier with mesenteric veins, but never mind. Nonetheless, the portal circulation goes to your liver. And now we have this bacteria, Enterococcus gallinorum, which has a flagellum, which is propelling itself through the vascular system to the liver, creating inflammation in the liver resulting in these autoantibodies that I mentioned before, which then seem to create inflammation in the organs like the kidneys and the lungs and the brain and the heart. What is lupus? It's a failure to basically calm down the production of these autoantibodies. That's what Kelly's textbook of rheumatology is saying. So here we have new science showing that these autoantibodies are probably being spurned by a gut bacteria coming from the small intestines or the colon going to the liver. And this is a new article from Gut My Microbes 2020. Again, this is Dr. Vieira's group, and they're talking more about Enterococcus gallinarum being a trigger for a variety of autoimmune diseases. So read it if you're interested. So this is the gut association to lupus. There's other research throughout the years on decreased uh, gut-associated lymphoid tissue and lupus patients, but this really, really drives home the point of quote-unquote leaky gut, bad term, but it is a term that's used, leaky gut and lupus. So let me know if you have any questions. Thank you all for joining tonight. Appreciate you watching, and, um, and I hope you all have a lovely